The quest for entertainment is as ancient as civilization itself. As far back as we can see, art from ancient societies all over the world depict men and women doing their best to avoid boredom. First came adding seasoning to raw meat and cooking it over an open flame. Then waiting under apple trees to prove that things really do fall. Then colonizing other nations. All the way until the day Benjamin Franklin invented electricity by throwing keys into the sky. This all culminated in 1958, when a physicist by the name of William Higginbotham took a well-known boredom evasion by the name of sports and applied it to a primitive screen. He called it Tennis for Two, a video game. The concept was revolutionary. Lights danced on a screen that reacted to your pushing of a button. Naturally, we thought as a society, there must be a market for this. So we got to work. The race to offer a more accessible and more fun video game was underway. While governments raced to reach space and the moon first, nerds rallied behind computer space and Pong. Other games followed like Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, Street Fighter, and so forth, ushering in a new age in entertainment known as the Arcade Golden Age. Now this was my dad's experience with gaming. I still remember being a kid and playing a demo of The Force Unleashed in Best Buy and he was like, gee, video games sure have come a long way from when I was a kid. I remember when getting the best score in Galaga was what made you the coolest guy around. Back then, you actually had to leave your house with a pocket full of quarters to play the game. But my dad's generation was living in the Stone Age because in 1981, something came around that would change gaming forever. Have you been thinking about buying a home computer with Christmas and Hanukkah just a few months away? Your children, and maybe some older children, may have already put them on their most wanted lists. Kids told their parents that they wanted one of these babies so they could work on their math homework, but this kid knew what he wanted to do. Use it for mostly. Well, probably uh, schoolwork and because they have like cartridges that could teach you stuff and math and stuff. Text-based games became popular and eventually spurred the very first MMORPG called Neverwinter Nights in 1991. First-person shooters took off in the form of Doom in 1993, and while I could keep going down this line of video game history, that's not the focus of our video. But let's back up a few years. In 1984, a revolutionary new genre hit the market with the title Elite. This was the first true sandbox, where the game was yours to change as you desired. This genre lives on in games like Minecraft and No Man's Sky, Gary's Mod, and pretty much every Rockstar release. In February of 1989, two games followed Elite's example. SimCity introduced a city builder game which allowed players to build a city while managing things like population growth, tax revenue, zoning, roads, and so much more all the while avoiding bankruptcy. This genre would continue to thrive through games like City Skylines and inspire the base builder genre with games like Age of Empires and Clash of Clans. A few months later, a young developer by the name of Peter Molyneux released a game called Populous. And the first feature I spoke about was how come the screen's gone black. This was the first God game, a game where you're not just the mayor of a city or the chieftain of a tribe, but the god of a world. A world that you mold to your liking and are permitted to build up and destroy everything at your own whim. This led into more classic titles like The Sims, Black and White, which was another Peter Molyneux classic, Spore, and so on and so forth. Then in 1999, a Scottish genius by the name of Chris Sawyer looked at these city builder games and god games and thought, I knew what to do. But does it hold up? Let's find out. First off, I had to turn my volume almost all the way down because Christopher decided to make the main menu start off with the sound of screaming children and horror music box sounds. But after my eardrums recovered, I started playing. Or at least looked around to see how. I guess it's this one. It's been a while since I played an old game like this, so there are things I've gotten accustomed to over the years, not the least of which are words on the main menu. I wouldn't say I'm a graduate of the game yet, and I know I don't have any saves yet, 
So I guess the icons here are good enough. I'm, I'm sure there will be a tutorial or something. Oh, I guess not. The graduation cap must have meant I still needed to learn. That doesn't make sense. Oh, oh well, well, onward and upward. It's okay, I can figure this out. Just let me pan over using WASD and nope, nope, that didn't work. Uh, well, at least I could zoom in by scrolling, right? No. Okay, I'll just look at these hotkeys and make this work a little bit. Yeah, games didn't quite have the standard when it came to hotkeys and controls at the time, so I can't really fault the game for that. Once I changed some of the hotkeys, I was able to go ahead and start building my part. I will say though, at the end of this, I'm surprised at how little complaints I had about this game 20 years after its release date. As I settled into my first park, I was easing into building smaller coasters, given that the overall map size was pretty tiny. Most of it was actually pretty intuitive as well. Sure, you can't see the pre-made coasters before you place them, and so you end up having to delete them and rebuild them. I mean, honestly, that wasn't a big deal. And with each new park came new landscape that I had to cater to. Building tracks to perfectly align the hills and neighboring coasters became somewhat of an art form, one that I did not get to perfect. But one of the magic things about these parks is that you can always find space for another coaster just when you thought you were out of space. For example, I set this merry-go-round down in the corner of the park, and it didn't take hardly any room at all, and then I was able to build a little path, and there we go. Before I knew it, there were five other rides surrounding it, going above it, and just all over the place. The best part is that it adds a little ambient music to go with it as well. And look, people love it. Eventually, I met my goal and moved on to the second part. Once again, I found myself getting lost in the game as I placed my first coaster, making it twist just right to fit where I needed it to. Later, I accidentally made one coaster too intense for some people, but I just left it. I mean, if you're not man enough to get on this ride, you shouldn't be here. Speaking of which, why are all the guests men? No children, no women, and everybody comes alone. Like, there isn't anybody here as a family? Or on a date? Or... A woman? Also, I hate to be that guy, but I can't help but notice that they all share a certain complexion. It's a gamer's dream, I guess. As I started a new save in each part, I was introduced with a certain goal and deadline that I needed to hit before it would consider me winner. But the real goal for me was paying off my $10,000 loan that I got at the start of each save. I don't know why, but there's such great satisfaction knowing that you started 10 grand in the hole, and through hard work and perseverance you could slowly pay it down and get to keep 100% of the money you rake in. There are little side achievements that you can win as well, like best value park, or tidiest park, this was before Steam and Xbox Achievement, so it's a nice little goal to shoot for if you're able to actually figure out how to do it intentionally. I, I don't know, but I did win some of them. Not all of them are good though. In the third park, I got worst value part. And frankly, I feel like that was unearned. So what if the entry fee is more than most people have in their pockets? I know my worth. That merry-go-round music is, uh, is starting to get a little old, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I guess I could turn it off, but that's... That's half the fun of the merry-go-round. I can't take that away from guest 638. Plus, it just gets so quiet without it. Like, all I hear is the occasional cha-ching and ambiance of the park. I'll just further expand the park and add music to these other rides. That, that way, I don't have to hear the merry-go-round quite as much. You know how in city skylines, the best thing to earn money is to build a medium-sized city and just let it sit for like an hour? Well, there's a similar thing here, but it doesn't take quite as long. Once you get about 10 rides built, you're pretty much set. Most of the time, I was able to get my loan paid off about halfway through my run, and I ended up having to wait for new attractions to get research anyways. So I could just blow $20,000 on an excessively large go-kart track, or I could run five different marketing campaigns and watch my attendance go up. So I recorded a little bit about drowning somebody in the park, but I forgot to write down the timestamp, and I had to sift through like eight hours of footage to try to find it, so... Yeah. There's a ton to like about this game, from the satisfaction of watching your money go up, to the guests buying the different colored balloons you've laid out, to little milestones you achieve throughout each save. There's even a bunch of little touches that you wouldn't think of. For example, if a ride is too intense for a guest, they'll walk up, see how intense it is, their eyes pop out of their heads, and then they turn around and walk away. 
When they've gotten too nauseated by a ride, their faces turn green for a while before puking. They don't just appear at the entrance gate either, they walk up from off the map with a set amount of money in their pocket, and if the emission price is too high, they walk away. You can also pop balloons that people let go of, ducks quack if you click on them, and when you win, all the guests face the screen and clap for you. It's like we were all working together toward a common goal and I was their leader. Finally, some validation for spending hours on a video game. Thank you, Polygons. Oh man, that merry-go-round, it won't stop. Holy crap, why did they have to make it so repetitive? When I decided to download this game, I really didn't know what to expect. It had been 15 years since I had played the thing, but what I definitely didn't expect was turning it on and playing for 14 hours straight. For the first time since I was probably 13 or so, I played a video game straight through the night. It really succeeds in hooking you. There's always something to do, some booth to add, a coaster to build, a new addition to test, and a new park to start. And before you know it, daylight is coming through your window. L luckily for me, I was on winter break, so I didn't have anywhere to be. Uh, but I was really surprised at the sheer amount of customization options I had as well. I mean, it's not cyberpunk levels of personalization, but it's damn well just as satisfying. I had a great time picking out the color for the rails, supports, logs, chutes, balloons, bumper cars, paths, and so on. It's a small feature, but it adds just that much more to the feeling that this is my part. There's a sort of pride knowing that I made something completely unique. Nobody else on Earth has had this exact combination of rides and booths with these exact same color screams on this exact same map. The games help you out every once in a while too. It doesn't hold your hand and constantly stop the game to teach you the basics, but it's really helpful nonetheless. The help comes in the form of notifications at the bottom of the screen. Maybe you need to hire more staff, lower the price of your part, raise the price of your part, and add more food stalls. I found this to be a great gauge in trying to figure out how much guests actually enjoyed being in the park. Although in the last save I played, I discovered that it's not always right. It kept telling me that the ticket price was too cheap, so I kept raising it. I raised it every time it told me to until I hit the max ticket price. $100. At that point my attendance actually started to go down because the most money that people generally had on them was $80 to start. And if they could afford to go in, they couldn't spend any money inside the park at all on food, souvenirs, rides, or even a park map. Naturally, I probably could have made everything inside the park free, but then food and drink stalls would have started to lose money too. At this point my finances started to suffer, but the game didn't seem to think anything was wrong. So I decided on my own yes, I had an original thought for once, to drop the price back down to $50, and then my income and park attendance steadily began to climb again. The game notified me that my ticket price was too cheap again, but I ignored it, because I knew better. So while these tips can be helpful, I think it's important to get to know the cause and effect of raising prices and monitor your park's attendance anytime you make a major change like that. I went into this game fully expecting to do a spiffing Brit kind of thing and just build a bunch of broken rides that fly off the rails and crash into a bunch of people or just drown a bunch of guests that came in for no reason. I consider trapping people in an endless loop of riding a particular coaster for all eternity or charging exorbitant prices just to use the restroom. Incredibly, I never got the urge to do any of those things. Although I'm sure that's a fun way to play the game, I was just so caught up in what the game actually wanted me to do that I never got bored enough to sabotage my own success with it. Periodically, I'd zoom out completely and marvel at my creation. The murmuring of the crowd and the cha-ching from the stands and the screams from the rides, they all just faded away. All I heard was a gentle breeze. It's just nice, calming sound as I sat back and admired my handiwork. As I progressed level by level, ride by ride, award by award, I had such a strange sense of accomplishment. It's no wonder sandbox games and city builders have such a huge market these days. You get to exercise your creative brain and create something original, and who wouldn't love that?
But then that merry-go-round music comes back and drives you mad. It, it plays on repeat non-stop for hours. You just, you just have, have to say, say that you're fine, fine and you're, and you're not, not really fine. fine. But it keeps going and going and going. And yes, I know the pathways are disgusting. I've already hired 20 handymen. What else do you want me to do? Stop breaking the benches. Why don't my security guards just do their jobs? Somebody turn off that music. Why do all the technicians just keep walking in circles when there are three rides broken? I dropped you right in front of it. Just fix it. This ride is too thrilling, but this one isn't thrilling enough. Which is it, Goldilocks? I'm doing the best I can. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Well, I hope you enjoy that video. Give this video a like and subscribe if you'd like to see more content from me. I've got another movie review coming up next, and then I'm gonna continue my KOTOR playthrough. Comment below your memories of playing Roller Coaster Tycoon, or your current experiences if you're still playing today. I've got a lot of these older games that I wanna go back and review, so stick with me and see if I'll talk about some of your favorites.